How should I begin this story? Once upon a time, perhaps. But no, that's not right. That makes it a story of long ago and far away. And it's not that kind of story. It's not that kind of story at all. Better then to begin the tale as I remember it. After all, it is my story, mine to tell. Mine in experience. I am old now, but I am not foolish. I still bar the doors and lock the windows at night. I still check in the shadows before I sleep and give the dogs free roam through the house. For they will smell him if he comes again, and I will be ready for him. He will take no one from my house. He will steal no child from under my roof. My father was not such a careful man. He had heard the old stories, for he told them to me by the fire when I was a boy, tales of the Sandman who tears out the eyes of small boys who will not sleep, and Baba Yaga, the demon witch who rides in a chariot of old bones and rests her palms on the skulls of children, and of Scylla, the sea monster, who drags sailors into the depths and has an appetite that can never be appeased. But he never spoke of the Earl King. All my father would say was that I should not venture into the woods alone, and that I should never stay out beyond nightfall. There were things out there, he would say, wolves, and worse than wolves. We lived in a small house close to the edge of the forest at the northern end of our little town. At night the moon would gild the trees with silver, relieving the dark expanse of woodland and creating silver spire upon silver spire receding into the distance like a convergence of churches. It seemed that we lived our lives at the very edge of civilization, aware always that beyond us lay the wildness of the forest. When we played in the schoolyard, our cries hung in the air for a moment, then seemed to be sucked beyond the tree line, our childish voices wandering lost between the trees before fading at last into nothingness. And beyond that tree line, something waited. It drew our voices from the air, like a hand taking an apple from a tree, and it devoured us in its mind. The first time I saw it, there was snow on the ground, the first fall of that winter. We were playing in a field by the churchyard, chasing a red ball which stood out like blood upon the whiteness of the drifts. A gust of wind rose where no wind had been before. It carried the ball upon it until it came to rest in a patch of young alders some distance into the forest. Unthinkingly I followed. As soon as I passed beyond the first of the great fir trees, it seemed as if the air around me grew colder, and the voices of my companions were lost to me. I passed further into the forest, the imprint of my passing trailing behind like an unseen rank of lost souls. I parted the alders and reached for the ball, and the wind spoke to me, said, Boy, come to me, boy. I looked around, but there was no one near me, no one close. But the voice came again, closer now, and in the shadows before me something moved. I thought at first that it was the branch of a tree, so thin and dark was it, its frame wreathed in grey, as if spiders had spun a thick web across it. But the branch reached out, and the twigs of its fingers gathered and beckoned. Waves of strange desire emanated from it. They washed over me like the tides of a polluted sea, leaving me filthy and soiled. Boy, beautiful boy, delicate boy, come, boy, embrace me. I pulled the ball to me and backed away, but my foot caught on one of the twisted roots beneath the snow. I fell heavily on my back, and something light touched my face. It was a gossamer strand of web, thin and sticky, which clung to my hair and seemed to coil around my fingers as I tried to push it away. Then a second fell, and a third, heavier now, like the filaments of a fishing net. I struggled and opened my mouth to cry out, but the web was falling thickly now, and the strands fell upon my tongue and tangled themselves around it so that I could not speak. With all the strength I had, I pushed myself backwards upon the ground and felt the strands catching on the roots beneath the snow, tearing apart and freeing me from their grasp. 
Branches scratched my face and snow gathered in my boots as I burst through the tree line, the ball still in my hands. As I drew away, that voice came again, boy, beautiful boy, and I knew that it wanted me, and that it would not rest until it tasted me. That night, I could not sleep. I recalled the web and the voice of the darkness of the forest, and my eyes refused to close. I twisted and turned, but I could find no rest. Despite the cold outside, the room was unbearably warm, so that I was forced to kick the sheet from my body and lie naked upon the bed. Yet I must have slept for a time, because it seemed that something caused my eyes to flicker open, and I found the light in the room was no longer what it had been. There were shadows in the corners. They shifted and moved, but the trees outside remained undisturbed and the curtains on the windows hung dull and unmoving. And then I heard it, a soft, low voice, like the rustling of dead leaves. Boy! I rose up suddenly, my hands reaching for the sheet to cover my body, but the sheet was gone. I looked around and saw it tossed in the corner of the room. Even in my worst thrashings, I could not have sent it so far from my bed. Boy, come to me, boy! and in that corner something seemed to hover. It was grey, almost shapeless, like an old blanket that had begun to rot, and strands of spider-web filigreed themselves upon it. The moonlight illuminated folds of faded, wrinkled skin that hung across its stick-thin arms, and those twig-like fingers that beckoned me over. Where its face might have been, there was only darkness. Come to me, boy, it repeated. Let me hold you. No, I said. I curled my legs up before me, trying to make myself as small as possible, to show it as little of my body as I could. No, go away. At the ends of its fingers, something glittered. A mirror. Its frame carefully ornamented. Shapes like dragons chasing each other round its edges. Look, boy, a gift for you if you come to me. The mirror's face was turned to me, and for an instant I saw my own face reflected in its surface, and for that single fleeting second in the mirror's bright reaches I was not alone. Other faces crowded around mine, tiny faces, tens, hundreds, thousands of them, a whole legion of the lost. Small fists beat at the glass, as if hoping to break through to the other side, and among them its eyes huge with terror. I saw my own face, and I knew that this was how it could be. Please, leave me alone. The thing hissed, and for the first time I became conscious of the smell, a dense, loamy stench of rotting leaves and still dank water. A lighter, less foul smell drifted in and out of my senses, curling through the odour of decay like a snake through the undergrowth. It was Alder Bark. I am the Earl King. I have always been. I will always be. I am the Earl King, and I take what I desire. Would you deny me my desire, boy? From where its eyes should have been, two moths fluttered, tiny death's heads visible on their wings and its thin, gnarled fingers reached for me, and something caught in its voice as its desire overwhelmed it. It advanced, and with all the strength of will that I could muster, I sprang from my bed and leaped for the door. From behind me came the sound of leaves rustling and branches scraping. I twisted the door handle, but the sweat on my palms made it slippery and treacherous. I fumbled once, then again. The smell of rotting vegetation grew stronger in my nostrils. I let out a little whine of panic, and then the doorknob was turning. My feet were on the passageway, and the branches were scraping at my naked back. I wrenched myself away, and with one twisting motion pulled the door closed behind me. I should have run to my father then, but some instinct sent me to the fireplace where the last flickering embers of the fire still remained. I took a stick from the woodpile, wrapped a rag around it, and soaked it in oil from the lamp. I plunged it into the fire and watched as the flames leaped before me. 
I took a hearthrug from the floor and wrapped it round my body, then my bare feet slapping softly on the cold flagstones I made my way back to my room. I swallowed once, then turned the handle of the door and pushed it open slowly with my foot. The room was empty. The only shadows that moved came from the flickering of the flame. I advanced to the corner where the Earl King had stood, but now there were only cobwebs and the drained husks of dead insects. I stood at the window, but the woods beyond were quiet. I pulled the window closed, but as I stretched to do so I became aware of a pain in my back. I reached behind me, and my fingers came back with blood on the tips. In the small shard of mirror that hung above my jug and bowl, I could see a series of four long slashes across my back. Then, for the first time, I thought that I screamed, except that no noise came from my lips. Instead, the scream came from the room where my father and mother both slept, and I followed the sound. In the sputtering light of the flame I saw my father at the open window. My mother on her knees, beside the overturned crib where my younger brother slept each night, swaddled in blankets. Now there was no sleeping infant in the crib. The blankets were strewn across the floor in a dense, loamy smell, as of rotting leaves and still waters, hung in the room. My mother never recovered. She cried and cried, until at last she could cry no more. And then she died. And my father grew old and quiet, and the sadness hung about him like a mist. I could not confess to him that I had denied the Earl King, and that he had taken another in my place. I carried the blame inside me and vowed that I would never let him take another being who was in my protection. Now I lock the windows and bar the doors to the outside and give the dogs free roam of the house. My children's doors are never locked so that I can reach them quickly, day or night. And I tell them that if they hear a knocking of branches at the window, they must call me and never, ever open the window themselves. And in the light of the fire, I tell them tales of the Sandman, who tears out the eyes of small boys who will not sleep, and of Baba Yaga, the demon witch, who rides in a chariot of old bones, and rests her palms on the skulls of children, and of Scylla, who drags sailors into the depths, and has an appetite that can never be appeased. And I tell them of the Earl King, with his stick-like arms and his soft, rustling voice, and his gifts to trap the unwary, and his appetites, which are so much worse than anything they can imagine. I will not make my father's mistake. I will not deny the reality of his existence and of those like him. I tell them of his desires so that they will know and they will be ready for him when he comes. <laughs>